Hello and welcome. My name is Lippi Turner Rahman, and I'm the Director of Development for WSU Libraries. I'm also the guest curator of the museum's current exhibit, Our Stories, Our Lives, Erwin Nash Photographs of the Yakima Valley Migrant Labor, which is related to my previous work as the library's Kimball Digitization Center, where I served as manager. On behalf of myself and the Jordan Snitzer Museum of Art, we wish to welcome you to this guided conversation. Before we begin, though, let us acknowledge WSU is located on the ceded lands of the Nimipu, the Nez Pierce tribe, and the traditional homelands of the Palouse Band of Indians. We acknowledge their presence here since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. Okay, so we're really honored to have uh, with us a really esteemed uh, group of special guests that you see sitting here, um, including Laura Celeste, uh, Daisy Zavala Magnania, I'm, I hope I didn't do so much damage, and Juventino Aranda. Um, Aranda's exhibit has recently opened at the museum creating a unique opportunity for us to consider the representations of issues pertaining to Americans of Mexican heritage, both through the lens of contemporary art as well as Erwin Nash's photojournalism. And in a moment, I will ask all of these wonderful panelists to introduce themselves. But first, I want to recognize Erwin Nash who really wanted to be here but couldn't and hopefully is watching live stream. Without him, the, um, our lives, our stories would not happen. I also want to acknowledge Lupe Gamboa, Michael Fox, and Grace Cisnarius, who are sitting in the audience here for doing the good fight of social justice in the Yakima Valley. I also want to acknowledge Michael Fong, without who uh, a lot of this would not have started. Okay, the exhibits, um, as well as this afternoon's program, was made possible through the support of wonderful people, so here I'll go, through the support of WSU Libraries, the Samuel H. and Patricia W. Smith Endowment, the Walla Walla Foundry, Nancy Spitzer, Marilyn Kimball, Judith and Clee Worth, the Yakima Migrant Labor Community, and CMAR organizations. Thank you so much, all of you. Without you, this would not have happened. Okay, so I would like to have go down and ask each of our guests to um, introduce themselves. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Daisy Savala Magaña. I'm actually a recent graduate from Washington State University. I graduated in 2021 as a first gen student. Um, yeah, and, and now I'm working at the Seattle Times. I am a journalist. I, a lot of uh, the work that I do, um, especially at the height of the pandemic, focused on farm workers, labor rights, and um, the brunt and, and the labor and, and you know everything in between. Um, when it comes to that, I am very excited um, to be here and to have seen um, the exhibit uh, today with uh, Erwin Nash's photos and they're all really beautiful and I think they really capture um, the reality of what it is to be a migrant worker. I'm Juventino Aranda. I am from Walla Walla. And um, as with the stories of Erwin's Nash's photos, um, speak to also to the Walla Walla Valley and my own family's um, experience. And um, I want to say thank you to the museum for inviting me to um, have an exhibition here at this wonderful space. It has been um, amazing to see and work with um, Ryan Hardesty, the curator, to develop the programming and, uh, and bring the whole show to fruition. Um, I am a graduate of Eastern Washington University and um, was very familiar with Washington State University as an option for um, going to college. Um, and I chose Eastern Washington University for its uh, rural location, being that I come from a very small town. Walla Walla is about 30,000 people. And I didn't want exactly to be overwhelmed immediately um, studying in a large city. Um, but at the same time, um, I, 
Pullman, Washington was, was, was pretty small and also too close to home. So I, I chose to venture out a little bit. Um, thank you. And my name is Laura Solis. Um, I, uh, am, I grew up in a town called Granger, Washington, which I think before, um, before this exhibit, maybe many people hadn't actually heard of. Um, and so it really, the, the places in the photographs are really, um, in, I feel like my backyard. Um, I grew up in a family of migrant farm workers. And um, in fact, many of the people who are in the photographs are related to me, which I also didn't know about until uh, we stumbled across the photos in, um, on WSU's online website. And um, we, we were, I think, at the time, just very blown away and very excited. And when I say we, I mean um, Mike Fong and, and myself um, saw the photographs, were very excited, and realized that there was only um, a, a very small number of them on the website. And so um, we reached out to uh, Lippy and uh, uh, the, the library to essentially give their, our perspective about what these photographs were and how much they would mean to the community. Um, and, and I think that was, um, that was the start of, of my involvement. And so it is a great honor to see um, these photographs presented and displayed in this way. And uh, I'm gonna try not to cry. I, every time I talk about the photographs, I cry. Um, so I'll try not to do that, but, but it is very beautiful and very moving. So thank you. Okay, everyone. So um, I'd like to ask this question of you. Um, the exhibit is titled, Our Stories, Our Lives, Erwin Nash Photographs of Yakima Valley Migrant Labor. You all grew up in or not far from that part of Washington where these photographs were taken. What stories come to mind from your own family and community backgrounds when you see Erwin Nash's images? Daisy, we'll start with yeah. you. Um, so I grew up in Wenatchee, which is also predominantly an agriculture town. Um, my parents immigrated uh, there from northern Mexico, Michoacan, if you know where it is, um, in the late 90s. And so they were farm workers in the, in the area, also going up to California. And I would do a lot of the work with them in the summers when I was out of school up until I graduated college. Um, and so just seeing a lot of the photos um, that just capture, you know, moments of rest or laughter, um, you know, beyond the fight, which is very real and, and the grueling work um, is, you know, sort of what I, what, you know, when I think about my time with my parents, you know, that's what comes to mind, you know, me taking my sketchbook when, you know, I'm the oldest, they can afford um, some, someone to take care of me, like, a, or send me to a daycare, so I would sit in the car and then, um, you know, like, sketch out the scenery. Um, there was a time there was a horse right in front of me, and I tried to sketch that out, but it <laughs> obviously did not look anything like um, what was in front of me, and so, I, I don't know, I just think back to all the moments where, you know, we, we bonded over just being next to each other, um, you know, meeting people there with a lot of the same experiences and same life stories, and we're also immigrants or uh, children of immigrants that were my age that also were pursuing higher education, and um, you know, we would spend our summer months in in, in the fields, um, you know, watching our parents face exploitation and not really being able to. Um, address that at all, but um, you know, hoping to one day get a degree in something that you know might be you know worthwhile and kind of make it all seem like you know it, it was for something. Yeah, I give a little background of of myself where um, I'd like to say is is an interesting that like where it's my mom was born in the states. She was born in the Rio Grande Valley, um, and so to speak to not being quite second generation, somewhat not first generation either, it's like I'm in this like one and a half generation. And to um, speak to the experience, um, my mom grew up, my mom grew up uh, going uh, between, be, between Texas, Washington, uh, North Dakota, Chicago, uh, I mean Illinois is what I'm getting at. And um, however, um, 
after my uncle was born, her, her brother after her, my grandpa decided to, to stay in Walla Walla. And so my family's history and, and origin, I guess, is Walla Walla. And um, my parents actually met in the Northwest. And my dad is an immigrant. Uh, you know, he immigrated from, um, uh, sorry, he, he came to the United States from um, Nuevo León. And so my grandma's from the same, pretty close to the same region. They never crossed paths. They never met each other um, as, as um, you know, their families never crossed paths, but they were pretty much just the town over. Um, and it wasn't until moving to Walla Walla that they were um, connected. Um, however, to uh, speak like to the pictures um, in, the, in the collection, um, I, my, work, my, my work is very autobiographical and, and, and like speaks to being like an archivist of sort. And um, seeing the photographs feels like going to, going to my grandparents' house, which, to give you some context, was across the street when I was growing up. Across the street was my grandparents. Um, uh, my tia lived behind us. And then my, my grandparents' other siblings lived um, in both directions of the street, going two blocks away. Uh, so going, going immediately over to, to, to my grandparents' house across the street, going and seeing the photographs all over the house and um, opening up the photo albums is like walking into the Nash, the Nash collections, um, curated photographs in this, in this exhibition. Um, so it's like, not only do I, do I see those experiences in there, but it feels like I just open up the like, family photo album. Um, I speak a little bit too of how I arrived at also art is that um, my grandma would, was the, she was the, the quote artist. I always, I always think like, who's, who in the family is the artist? And so, to give you some context uh, to uh, large, like you know, Latino gatherings, being weddings, quinceañeras, funerals, you name it, um, my grandma was always the the um, I, I don't want to say decorator, but but the the person tapped to to make the recuerdos and and um, the things that you would to give you to give you some background. Give you the, it was like these takeaways from from uh, center, table center, you know, just table centerpieces. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that was really it, walking into the Nash, that's, that's exactly how I felt. Yeah, I, I'm so like floored to hear Daisy and Juventino talk essentially about my childhood <laughs> because <laughs> Daisy, I had the same experience where we grew up, um, you know, we were too young to cut asparagus, but we, but my parents also couldn't afford childcare, so we, um, we were sitting in a van in the, in the fields until you know we got too bored and started to venture out. Me and my cousins, um, we would start playing under asparagus boxes, and um, you know, and it was kind of a precursor to actually starting to work. You saw your parents work, and so eventually, you started to do things to help out, and then before you knew it, you were actually helping, um, and that's sort of the progression. So I, I definitely identify with your experience. And, and um, so a lot of the photographs that deal with the uh, workers cutting asparagus, it just brings, I feel like I could walk into the photograph and start cutting asparagus and helping, helping those guys. Um, so, and, and Juventino, my, my parents also were born in the Rio Grande Valley. My grandparents are from Nuevo Leon. And um, my, on my dad's side, my, parent, the, the, my family has been there for generations, actually, since, um, since the 1800s in, in Texas. So, um, so part of, I think, the, the migrant experience that is in the photographs is what speaks to me, the, the trucks loaded up with furniture. It's, um, it's a journey that I'm very familiar with. We had to put all of our belongings. We had to decide the important things we wanted to take, which stuffed animals. Um, you know, you had to make these really hard decisions about what you were going to take because not everything is going to fit on the truck. And it was like a three-day drive. You know, my dad would just be driving the entire time. He wouldn't sleep for three days. And we would just be in the back uh, in, under a camper eating sandwiches. Um, whenever we, you know, stopped and pulled over, and that that was that was our life until my parents decided that they could tell our education was suffering because of these trips, and so um, at some point they decided that they were going to make the sacrifice and try to stay, um, and and that's that sort of the rest is history. As we we stayed, and and that was to my benefit because then I could actually focus on my education and um, and they allowed me to do that and you know and I and I got a good education so 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's all, I think there's not a single photograph that I don't identify with. Every one of them is, has some meaning to me. Okay, so this um, question is to Laura specifically. So Laura, you've been active in spreading the word about the digitization of the collection, as well as sharing your own recollections about the places and people pictured in those photographs. Can you talk about why it is important to you to learn more about these images and to share them with others? And what do they mean to the current uh, Yakima farm worker community, to your elders and to future Latinos? I, I think it's for the same reasons that I think I'm discovering just being on this panel with Daisy and Juventino is um, the community building. The we're not alone. You know, my experiences or your experiences. You know, it, it's there's something so special about that, and I think. The photographs um, do that for us. We all identify with them. If you've had that experience, even even if you haven't, I think they all say something to to each one of us. And there, there's something magical that happens when you start talking about your shared experiences. Then the differences kind of fall away. The the you know all of these things that maybe you know, we're from different generations, you know. But but I share a connection with Daisy and Juventino is just one example. And so I think it's important for community. Um, it's also, it would have been important to me to know, for example, I went to UW Law School and I didn't find out about Lupe until this, this collection. And I reached out to him, I just cold called Lupe and I said, hey, do you know about these <laughs> photographs that WSU has? And I think knowing that Lupe had, you know, I had a tough time in law school. I, you know, I was a, you know, first generation, you know, uh, law student. I didn't know anything about what was going on. If I had had that connection with Lupe before, I think I felt like I would have been able to reach out. And so I think that's the other aspect of it that's important, that you know, it connects us to our own history. And um, it's all about connections to me, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Daisy, next question is for you. Erwin Nash has stated that he intended to call attention to the plight of a segment of the population that had never received the recognition and compensation merited by their contribution to our society. So as a journalist yourself, can you speak a little bit about storytelling efforts with those who have gone underdocumented or who remain invisible in mainstream media? Yeah, it's um, tough because, you know, even today they they still have not received the recognition even after you know, the conversations that were brought up uh, at the height of the pandemic where everybody was talking about how essential these workers are, but right, the wages never really reflected that. There wasn't really much shift at the time with how the state agencies um, over oversee um, violations or if, you know, the um, growers are following the rules as they should, um, not a lot of uh, proactive um, measures in place to make sure that happens. Um, as a journalist, I think what has made it a little tough was um, having to retrain my brain um, with what I was taught in journalism school, which was that there's this idea, right, that um, there needs to be a degree of separation between you yourself as a journalist and the person that you're speaking to to sort of uh, ma maintain some professional boundaries. Um, but that just doesn't work when you're talking to people that have been you know, harmed by newspapers and local media historically since the beginning. Um, and I think what has made it easy and what has brought that understanding to me um, at the very beginning of my career, right? I'm only like a, uh, a year in professionally, but I was freelancing like a long time before that, um, is that, you know, I am part of this community, right? So I know where we, stere where we get stereotyped, right? Like I understand um, how the narrative sort of reduces us to a fraction of um, you know what we are and who we are and what our communities contribute, um, and so just being aware of that and you know reaching out to people and making it clear you you don't have to talk to me, you don't owe me anything, but I want to talk to you and I want to learn from you and I want you to feel safe telling me about your experience because it is extremely valuable um, for any story um, about your community. Um, there's just no way to write anything accurate without 
talking to members of that community and um, you know you, you need to be able to build a relationship um, first and foremost you know like that is ultimately um, the most important part of you know doing journalism well um, when you're covering underrepresented and historically marginalized and um, exploited groups you just you know, you can't go in and, and pretend like they have to talk to you or act like they have to t they have to talk to you just because you know you work here or there as a journalist. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just think back also to um, growing up in Wenatchee and you know not ever seeing our stories in our local paper um, unless it was something tragic. You know, that's the only time we ever made the news. It's you know when a worker died or, you know, there's this massive strike, but, you know, even the strike coverage was, um, you know, very, very, it, it leaned very much to the employer or the grower um, because of that, that lack of access, right? Like you are not, you've never made yourself present as a paper, as a journalist to this community. So, you know, they first off don't feel comfortable talking to you. And so just having that experience growing up and then understanding the you know the migrant worker immigrant community because you know that's how i grew up those that's those are my parents um my uncles you know um some some of my uncles and um, extended family are still working in the fields my parents um sort of shifted to uh doing work in warehouses um yeah so it's so it's different but i think ultimately just um acknowledging that you know their stories matter and that I'm here to listen whether or not they decide to give me permission to publish their name or, or the information they gave me like I am here to talk to you is I think what has worked that's good um, so Huintino um, labor especially by workers of color is too often hidden from view Erwin Nash seems to strive for greater representation of individuals habitually, habitually sorry, omitted from the record. Can you talk about this facet in your own work? Yeah, my, my strive to be the, not only the record keeper, but the, um, the labels, the labels that come behind as, the labels that come with being, I don't know, said artist, fill in the blank. Like if you, what I, what I find difficult is when, is when somebody says, oh, you are, and they, and they put your label first. Um, so for me, it's important to, yes, I, I don't need to be reminded who, who I am and where I come from. I'm proud of it, I don't want to forget. Um, however, I am working currently to strip those labels from the like canon and art history of being labeled a, said artist. So currently, I, I have, moving forward for the last couple of years, I'm just an artist. I am not a Mexican-American artist. I'm not a Latino artist. I'm not a Latinx artist. It's, it's I'm an artist. Um, but I let that shine within my work that I am from said marginalized community. And not seeing that early on, or seeing, seeing the, the depictions of what a said artist was for me, um, didn't feel, didn't speak to me, like, and so that's why I, I took, the, took the route to, to be, I mean, I mean, in the struggle, let me just say, to be in the struggle, I like, I like to listen to what you had to say, Daisy, about, about being the record keeper for, you, you the record keeper as writing, and like, and to, to make sure they were represented in that, and then also then the like defense of defending, you know, the struggle, and, so we're all important, like we're in all an important facet of, of, of being the record keeper um, and making sure that that is not forgotten. Um, and so I just wanted to add, add more to that. Um, I do, I, um, no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm finished with that question, I'm sorry. So I guess one of the, I'm going a little bit off script here, um, 
Ryan's looking at me. <laughs> but, um, so one of the things, you know, you talked about how they're unknown. And I think when I was curating, when we were doing the database, um, it was really important for me uh, to have everybody's. If you look at the exhibit, you'll see that every photograph has actually a person's name on it. Um, and I remember my coworker saying, I don't understand, why do you have to have everybody's name? Okay, we don't need to know every, you know, it's okay, we, we'll get there. But the naming process, you know, names, uh, so f coming from a South Asian uh, heritage, uh, f in, our, in that culture, when people know your name and they say your name, um, that means you're kept alive and you are alive. And also, just to have that connection, you know, when you don't know someone's name, it's easier to put that distance between yourself. And when you know someone's name, as Laura said, there is a connection. So how, how, are, you, how are you making those connections between your communities and maybe the other, um, the bigger world or, you know, um, the greater world out there, that's not your community. What, what steps are you taking? Yeah. I mean, I think it's very similar in the way that, you know, you open, or I open myself up to, to say, I want to know you, right? Um, and I think that just translates across cultures and just being open to learning from the person that is, you know, sitting, standing, whatever, right in front of you, um, and just be in that moment and acknowledge, you know, that you can share um, a little bit about your life, um, your aspirations or, you know, your struggles, um, you know, with someone else who's here to listen and, and here to care. Um, and I think even just prefacing that and, you know, having or, or um, you know, like making sure that that's known um, before asking for an interview or asking somebody to give you something um, is really important. And I think that like I don't, I don't know how to operate any other way because um, community to me has always been the most important thing um, in my family, um, my you know, in my town, or, or you know, just even outside my family. You know, you sort of cultivate connections with. Um, people that share, you know, similar um, values as you, or even just inclinations to to whatever, you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, but names are are so important, and I think that's one of like the biggest struggles that I've had is when, you know, you're writing about labor rights or farm workers or um, immigrant issues and you know, you, you have to understand, like, sometimes there, you know, the story won't be what you want it to be because you need to keep the person who spoke to you safe first, um, you know, and, and their story is very important and, um, you know, and, it, and sometimes they want to share it, but um, sometimes when they're undocumented, it's better to not, um, you know, go on record like that. Um, but I think, you know, with, with, with that said, I, I think just, again, like being human, and I keep saying that, and I'll probably keep saying it all throughout the panel, but um, I think just that point of connection and, and you know, making someone realize like their story matters, because a lot of the times because they're not on the paper, or they're not front page, center, or, or whatever, you start to feel like, you know, you don't matter as a person, um, you don't matter, your story isn't really worthy of attention, um, and so you never really address, you know, the struggles maybe that you're facing beyond that, because um, you feel like, you know, you've never gotten justice, your community's never gotten justice, so like, what what would be different, you know, this time around? That you, human to know. Uh, yeah, can I, can I, uh, this yeah. may be a tangent on, on, on the names, but I think it's, it's very empowering to, to have someone's name labeled to, to their photograph, but at the same time, the, um, the having your name in full is empowering. I have spoken to other other children. I say children, as in I'm 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 I'm, a, I'm an adult. But but um, a young as a younger adult, um, and primarily in in, in um, uh, grade school, 
um, I had a short. I have a short because I'm a junior, and so then I just made it, I made it easier for the teacher to pronounce my name whenever a role was being taken. And, and so uh, that was like, it, it was, there was a sense of shame in, in, not, in, in both being not recognized like everybody else was. Nobody else had to go buy a short. And so then as I got older, I took my name back, and I'm like, nope, you have to pronounce my name in full. If you, it, if you can't, just give it, give it a try. And, 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 and it usually works out. People, people tend to give it a try, and then I correct them. I'd, but but it's, it is, it's, it's empowering to, to um, you know, because in, in America, other, other people who have um, names that are derived to be said easy in English, um, no one ever has to be corrected in that, and that then they never have to be said what is your short um, or how do you pronounce your name. So uh, that was it's it's empowering to see to see uh, that connection of names with with the works. Yeah, I think I'll just talk about uh, maybe a little bit of a different perspective, um, which related to how we ran across the photographs in the first place, which was through a genealogy research. We were doing gene genealogy research on my, my parents, and, uh, and this, this is essentially how we came across the WSU's online um, website. And, you know, as you, if anyone has done genealogy research, you know it's all about names, right? You, you're tracking down people's names, and names are important, and the reason they're important is because they connect us um, to our people, to our history, to our families. And so I, I think the names are in, incredibly important. And so I think um, the, the photographs would be powerful, and they are powerful without the names. Um, and, but I think my first, very first question was, who are these people? Because they feel like people I know. And immediately, my first instinct was to connect with them. I felt like I was connected to them, and I think I, I am, as it turns out, connected to them. So, um, so I, I think that's, that's one aspect of why I think that, that names are important. And, and you know, it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, I think, potentially, because maybe, you know, I've often thought about do people want to be recognized for, you know, the, the, the advocacy they were doing and the work that they were doing, and, and that's that's a whole other you know conversation maybe. But I do. There's power in in naming, um, and and there's there's just a curiosity, and I think that can only lead to good things. Okay, so um, I'm just going to read one more off before we have the thing. Is I'm really interested in. What the storytelling, and I think Daisy talked about it, but um, how does um, Mexican American Latino storytelling tradition differ from, say, um, I would say like maybe European or white American storytelling? Does it differ or? Yeah, definitely. Um in journalism, I mean, in any newspaper and, and, and is, you know, geared to cover stories for a white audience. And so a lot of the times um, our stories, Latino stories, um, and not even just Latinos, but communities of color, black, indigenous communities, our stories are framed in a certain way where, so that it's palatable for um, white communities. And so a lot of the context and history that should be in, you know, um, articles sort of is just erased. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, there's a lot of really great journalists, though, that are trying to tackle that, but it's really hard to do when norms or, you know, traditional legacy papers are unwilling to change um, and make sure that equity is spread out all throughout the paper and their site and not just one position, right? Because it's very easy to um, hire someone to say, okay, you focus on arts and culture or you focus on, on this community, but 
fair coverage and race and equity is just something that should be spread throughout like politics, city hall government, and, and, and whatever else, right? Um, so yeah, it definitely differs and it's, um, you know, if we ever really get any coverage, which is, you know, another thing, um, when we do, it's usually not written for us. So we get written about, and so that's one of the things that I really try to do is make sure that I'm not writing about this community and I'm writing it for them as well. So the, how is that markedly difference in your approach then? Um, it's, it's a lot of having, um, honest conversations about, you know, hey, what, what do you think about, you know, the Seattle Times, for example, or, or where I work? Um, you, know, uh, you know, and a lot of times people are very candid about, you know, our faults and our failures, and I really appreciate that, um, you know, because no one place is perfect, and there's a desire for improvement and a desire to make sure that these stories are told properly. Um, and so, yeah. Valentina? Yeah, I'd like to add to that, that, <laughs> that to me, the stories are always that of romanticized, they're romanticized. They are um, the, the, the victor, the, the success stories. And um, I think back to most recently where, I mean, my, my, my family tells good stories. Of course they tell good stories. And, and we all, uh, like, to some extent, everyone does have a, can have a negative story within their family. But, but uh, um, I think, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily adding to, to Daisy's uh, uh, there, but, but essentially um, that story of also then wanting to um, learn more. So for example, most recently this winter, I was, I was uh, digging with my, with my dad before, you know, he's getting older and so is my mom, and, and getting these stories straight just to make sure that I have the, the full record. And one of those stories was my dad telling me how uh, when he was younger, coming down from the mountain, quote, coming down from the mountain. And I hear those, also those same stories of coming down from the mountain in America with, with uh, people who come from, I don't know, the East Coast. You hear, I always hear these, these stories of coming down from the mountain from people who are like, I don't know, the South or um, the Appalachian area, so forth. Um, but for example, uh, my dad, he, um, him, him and his family came, when they came down from the mountain to, it was, he was, a young young adult. So, um, but he learned Spanish. His his father was his dad was um, uh, Spanish. But um, my my uh, my dad's mom, my grandma, she she was uh, indigenous and um, still spoke the dialect. And and my dad was was reliving all those stories, and I was just, just taking it all in and 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 recording them. And and there came a point where he said, "No, nope, I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's that's." It's it's um, the struggle, right? That 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 it was too painful to to continue the story, and so um, maybe maybe you know the next holiday we'll, we'll we'll or not next holiday per se, but but the next time we talk, we'll we'll <laughs> I'll see if he'll tell me more, um, just so that then I can then interpret those stories, so that that way not interpret them to change history, um, but at least um, be able to tell a story of the struggle, and um, not let it, you know. Uh, die essentially. I, you know, I wanted to just something that came up as Huvinthina Huben, was talking, um, because I often wonder why I didn't already know these stories, um, and I, I think that he's essentially hit on why, which is there's so much pain in, in them uh, sometimes. And you know, my mom every now every now and then my parents will say tell a story that has so much impact on me, and and they'll just say it in a very offhand way. And it's not an invitation for a conversation, it's just a very offhand. Like my mom talks about when they lived in a, a cardboard shack. And I was just stunned. I was like, you lived in a cardboard. It was made out of cardboard. She said, yeah, it was made out of cardboard. It was like a room, but it was made out of cardboard. And um, on my dad's side, you know, there are stories of, you know, no health care, and the consequence was one of his, uh, or multiple siblings actually died um, in childhood. And so it's, it's a hard conversation to have with your parents who've gone through that. My, my grandparents from Mexico never talked about their history. They, they never talked about it. I, I didn't know anything about, I barely knew where they, um, they lived before they came to the United States. 
But um, so some, sometimes those stories are so painful, and, and I think it's, it's hard for us to engage um, around them. And, and that's another facet of the Nash collection, because I think now my parents sort of see the importance of the stories that they have, and they're more willing to share them. Um, they, they talk about the good things, but they, sometimes they don't talk about the painful things, and so it, it, it makes a difference in even being able to have those conversations. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Laura. So can you speak to the notion of the American dream? What does it mean for you, for your family, and for your community? And has the American dream changed for each of these um, categories I've given you, for you, your family, and your community? What does it mean and does it change? Oh gosh, so I, I don't know that I ever was raised with the idea of the American dream. Um, I think m my family had, it was a survival instinct. I mean, it really, they were moving so that they could survive, not so that, not, they, not because they had these visions of like the great life that they were gonna have in Washington State. You know, they really wanted to stay. Um, my, my dad's family had been there for generations in, in, in Texas and, and you know, they, they didn't wanna leave. He didn't wanna leave. Um, so it was more a survival instinct. But I think really um, now, you know, they're very proud of me and I owe everything I've done to them. And I think that to the extent that they ever had an American dream, maybe they didn't know it, but I think that they're living it now and, and I think I'm living it now. So yeah, I, I, I don't know that it was that fanciful place that maybe, maybe is a story in other, other people's lives, but, um, but at the end of it, I feel like actually you know, it, they've done so much and, and uh, they've accomplished so much. And so I think if, if I were to ask them that question, I think they might give me an answer that was like, you know, we're pretty proud of where we ended up. Yeah, I wanna, that, that, is, that is truth of, of that like, uh, well, let me, let me add, so, so first I'll add that it's, it, is, it is one of, um, it, for, for, from what I've experienced, it's one of like financial stability and, um, and the um, I'll just I'll just so that I can so that I can tell a story real quick about about that the the American dream of uh, speaking to that is it's funny that I you know I, I get these stories and I and I and I, I record them for, to my memory I need to actually log them but but another story within with my dad was when um, he came to America with with that dream of of the American dream not knowing that he was like. He was like yearning for that American dream, like that's what I am doing. I'm coming to America because it's there's this thing that they call the American dream. Um, he came to the United States for that, for the like more opportunities and prosperity, um, prosperity that um, he, he you know, we all we all we all need money, but sometimes there's money in excess um, for for some, and um, you know, for him. For him, he's listening to him tell stories of like, you know, there's enough food in the refrigerator. There's there's um, some guilty pleasures and I don't know sugar and and things like that that he that he enjoys that that he he can afford um, that he doesn't need um, a, a monstrous house, uh, many cars. Um, but um, to just give a real real quick that <laughs> my dad almost went back to to his hometown um, after he came to the states because. Um, I've, I've interpreted this in a, in a, in a, in a work um, that exists in an archive on my website, not necessarily in, in the exhibition, or it's an old work, and it speaks to um, the grass not really truly being greener on, on the other side, um, because when he came, it, it, it wasn't what was told to him, that there was gonna, that he, he came from a very, like, uh, temperate area, just like just like us here, in, in, or at least in Southeast Washington, and Walla Walla, see the Four Seasons, see some snow in the, or see a lot of snow in the winter. It gets hot, it's dry in the in the summer, um, and that was the same same area in in Monte Morelos where he's from, um, in Nuevo León, and um, when he when he came to um, the San Joaquin Valley and did and did a season in the grapes, he was like, this is not for me. 
uh, where I came from, I actually he because he had a um, he had a factory job at that time in the city, so that was that was a a um, a, a difference. Uh, as he as he grew older, he he was able to navigate different different jobs um, and learn different skills. And so when he came to the United States and said, "This I want I want a job similar to what I had, but not the heat," I guess essentially. And so it was that like difficult dry summer uh, when he came and. Um, Ed, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't exactly what was painted as the dream, and so that almost that almost faded away. But um, there was some family members in the Northwest that brought him up this way, and, and yeah, yeah. I think it's honestly kind of complicated um, for me to. I don't know, even um, try and unpack that one. I, I don't know, because I think I can, like I'm very aware that the reason that I'm able to live the life that I do and, um, you know, and, and be able to write for a living, which is something I enjoy and, and connect to community is a privilege that, you know, is only made possible because my parents came here. Um, but the only, But, you know, they had to struggle so much for me to get here and made a lot of sacrifices and um, experienced um, a lot of, you know, exploitation in, in these, you know, work sites where, you know, it's kind of, you know, to think of me having an American dream because of that sort of like my, you know, I fight against that because it sort of in my mind glamorizes. Um, all the struggles that they had to face, um, but at the same time, it's hard because you know it's very real that because they made that move and decided to, you know, bear all of that so that I could go to school um, and be able to have a career if that's something that I wanted to do is, you know, was afforded because of that. So I don't know. I I sometimes I. I guess like if I had to say, you know, what I, what I dream of is like I dream of my parents not having to like toil, <laughs> you know, so much because um, they're still working, um, you know, like factory jobs um, and that work is really heavy um, labor jobs, um, especially in places that are not unionized. Um, and so I don't know, it's, it's really complicated and I don't think, um, you know, every time they've spoken about it, um, you know, I think I'm 23 and I'm barely starting to hear um, some of, you know, the stories of things they experienced, um, what, you know, was sort of talked about earlier, like, you know, my, my dad's experience uh, crossing the border um, and things like that, um, you know, like really tough, difficult things that, um, you know, you know, you hear it because you know when you're a child, like, you know, okay, they did this, but then, you know, 23, 22, starting to hear the details of the reality of doing that with the hopes that your child will be able to just, bare minimum, have the option for an education, which is, you know, something they, they couldn't do um, in rural Mexico, you know, f for other reasons, you know, interventions and displacement and um, the violence that was pushed into that area. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's a really complicated one for me that I don't think I know the answer to yet. OK, I'm going to stop my questions. I'm going to open it up for you guys to ask a couple questions. Can, do you guys have another mic so that we can hear the question? My mic? I said, I have a question for Daisy. Uh, you know, when we were trying to organize in, in the fields in the early 70s, uh, the papers were not only anti, you know, didn't cover us, they were hostile to us. They were openly parodying the lines of, you know, the growers, and uh, and until recently, uh, the Seattle Times is, is it's a business paper, right? It's very conservative. It didn't cover really. I guess it had a labor reporter, but it didn't really cover too much of labor and very little on farm workers. 
And, and the same thing, of course, uh, the, the Yakima Herald. Uh, my question to you is, how did you manage to get hired there <laughs> with the perspective you have? Yeah. And does this indicate a change? And did they all of a sudden, you know, get the word, you know, get the spirit? Uh, and how do you find working there? How do you find working there with, with, your, with your ideas and, and, and uh, belief on injustice? Um, I, yeah, it's, you know, I think any legacy newspaper has, you know, decades of harm like that. And I think, you know, the Seattle Times is in a period right now where they're trying to address that. And there's a lot of um, employees uh, right now that, you know, are aware, right, um, of like just these long-term harms where, you know, we ignore these stories and you know, don't give it the attention that they deserve. Um, and so personally, you know, I, I went in as an intern and I was able to um, not only report on farm workers centering their voices where I could find people, like workers that were comfortable um, and, you know, safe enough, right, to go on record. Um, but, you know, I translated them too. Um, and so it was the first paper where, you know, I, I had the opportunity to do that um, at the time because they, you know, very much understood, you know, we can't just be writing about, you know, this community. Um, but I think with, you know, the, the rally coverage, it's also really tough because it's an issue I have too, right? Like, you know, I, I'll go and, you know, say we need to go cover this. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, traditional values and, and you know, in, like opinions, right, where it's like, no, unless there's thousands of people, right, um, then maybe we won't go. But, you know, there are, you know, the reality is that there are people out there that are, you know, even if it's only five, right, they're, they're real grievances. And so, you know, I think it's tough and, and it's really hard work because, I am very community oriented and it, you know, like people first. Um, and journalism as an industry, you know, historically, you know, you know, has only really amplified the, you know, affluent people, people with power, um, you know, quote unquote professionals with degrees and sort of up until, you know, recent decades or even years. Um, you know, realize like, you know, we need to do better and make sure that uh, everyday people are also reflected in these stories and especially the people that are most affected. So I don't know, it's, it's tough, you know, sometimes I hate journalism, <laughs> you know, sometimes I love it. I it just, it's a lot of, you know, back and forth because it's painful, right, to, to work in an industry where sometimes I want to push for something, but it just, maybe it's not gonna go my way because, you know, higher ups don't um, fundamentally agree with me. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there's like a lot of good work to do and there are papers and there are like people that are open to changing the industry. <laughs> First, I want to thank um, the museum for having this important conversation. I am the retention counselor at the Chicanx Latinx Student Center, El Diaz, at your service. And I am very, very proud. And I am a recent acquisition to Pullman, Washington. So it's, a, it's a, been very, very shocking. And <laughs> in many ways, you have no idea. But um, I do want to share that when I was invited by Christian to, to see the um, the collection of pictures, it was the second time. I had seen the, the one at the library, and then I had seen this, and really, they spoke to me. They spoke to me. I, I wanted to see, like, what actually happened to these people, you know? To the extent that uh, we were inspired to create the closing event of the Latin Heritage Month for an event that is going to be called that is called already Voices That Echo. Because we realize that 
these pictures could have been happening in the 1970s and still be happening now. So there is the past still here. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody for that. And now my question to who in there. Uh, when you envision those pictures, and of course you got carried away, only 10,000. <laughs> when you, when you, uh, what was your vision? What, what did you think? Or how did you think these pictures were going to impact? Well, Laura. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, gosh, I was so excited. Um, when I found out that there were 10,000, I was just like, we have, we have to see these. You know, we have to get them to the community. Um, there was no question in my mind that this was going to be monumental for the community. It, it, there's just none at all. Um, and the reason I first thought, even thought that that was true, I mean, I knew it was true because I, I personally I experienced it, but then my cousin wrote this beautiful post and he had um, seen one of the pictures on my social media page of my great aunt, um, Elisa Elizondo, and he wrote this beautiful tribute to her and it, it was so moving and it's actually in the exhibit. Um, thank you, Libby, for including that. Um, and that was the moment that I knew that these photographs had a bigger impact than just on me and certainly on our family, that they were gonna have a, a bigger impact for whoever saw them. And so um, I, I was so thrilled that there were 10,000 of them. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I, and I'm sure, I know, um, having spoken with Erwin, I know that, you know, they're not all, you know, what he would consider worthy of, of seeing, but I think they're worthy, I think every single one of them. And in fact, I can't get through them without having this emotional reaction, I can't. So when I look at the photograph, the collection of all 10,000, I have to do it in chunks because it, it, it's always, it's usually a picture of, um, of a little kid um, and it just, it just speaks to me so much. Um, those are the most moving ones to me. Um, but, but they're all moving. And so, so you know, every, every time, and even thinking about them, I, I want to cry. Um, but so I, I really appreciate that WSU actually had the foresight to, um, to get these and to, to preserve them and then to make them available to everybody because um, maybe we can't all, each of us get through 10,000, but um, the ones that we do see speak so much to us that I, you know, and, and seeing the collection, the, the curated collection has been so impressive. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's incredible. And I think there's so much more on the website. Um, is that right, Lippy? I think they're still available on the website. So um, if, if you really want to see, I think the breadth of what Irwin did in his work, it's worth looking at and trying to, trying to get to, to you know, see them, um, see them all. So I'm going to echo what Laura said, is that I actually have gone through all 10,000 photographs. I've, and, uh, and to cut them down to this collection, when Ryan said, OK, we'll do 50, and I think actually we cut it down to 45, I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> There's no way. Um, they are phenomenal. And they really, um, I echo Laura in that, I think my favorite photographs are um, definitely the ones of the children. And I love the ones of the children, all of them, but I love the ones where Erwin has been able to capture that intense moment of joy that each of these children have. And um, one of my favorite photos, not in this collection, but Ryan has promised me to give it to me from my office. Anyway, it's just that, you know? And I think that's what I was saying, how the naming builds that connection with communities that we think we really have no similarities or share the same values, but we do. And when it's people to people and we see that joy and the sadness that occurs in all of our communities and our families, that's where that connection happens. So, um, and for WSU, um, the reason that we wanted this collection 
uh, digitized, and again, I have to thank Marilyn Kimball for her foresight, is that it belongs to that um, you know, land-grant university charge of making things accessible to everybody. So even though we have this phenomenal collection, Laura couldn't come down from her day job to come to Mass to, between the hours of 8 and 5 weekdays. But now, because it's digitized, you can all, even if you sit in Canberra, you know, Australia, you can see that, those photographs, so check them out. Any other questions? I just wondered um, where else this exhibit is going to travel to. We, well, this exhibit will be here till March, and we definitely are, we'd love to have this exhibit go to the Yakima Valley. Um, and we're looking at venues to try and find, because for me, I really would love the community to see themselves, as Laura is saying, how they see, but to know that um, the outside community also sees them as they are, and I'm sure when you see them, you'll see that. So, and then we'd love to, Ryan and I would have to, love to have this go to the, over the mountainside uh, and be there in other venues. So we're working on it. Okay. Other questions? Um, this is a question for you three. Um, so I'm personally a farm worker myself. Um, I'm from Nayarit, Mexico, and this, I was on Tuesday. I came with a group here on campus called the Crimson Group, which is a group for undocumented students and allies on campus, and we were able to see the exhibition. It's gorgeous, very beautiful. Like, I cried. <laughs> I think it's very important to see, you know, the representation of, like, farm workers, especially being like a farm worker myself and my family, um, especially from like the valley. There's a lot of pictures from Sunnyside. Um, Sunny is very, very beautiful, but um, kind of to touch back on like what y'all had mentioned before, um, like sharing these stories and like not being able to always see all of the bad things that occurred because you know we were children and sometimes children, as children we don't really understand what's going on. Um, but now that we're adults, I do also notice that it's very difficult to talk about certain conversations, but it is also tied into like generational trauma and things that have been passed down. How have y'all overcome that? Like, how, what do you think like now as an adult you're able to see with your past experiences, something that can change in your life for you to be in a sense better communicators, but also just reflecting on like how you see and perceive specific things. Like, I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, like what do you think? made that change? I think that's a, such a good question. The um, generational trauma that we don't talk about. And when I see the photographs, a lot of times I see the, the positive, the um, family. And I, I really connect with that. I, and like, I just remember how great that was to spend time with your family in the fields. But I think taking a step back, you realize that that wasn't a good place for me to be. And my parents had to do it because they, they had to, not because they wanted to. So um, it wasn't a good place for me to be. But so it's, very, it's a very conflicted feeling because I have these strong emotions that were positive about that. Um, and, and I think that you know, the way that we grew up often had lasting trauma. And that the things that we've had to overcome that we didn't necessarily even knew we had with us. And so, I discovered a lot of that in law school, actually, when I realized that you know, I'm, not, I'm not positioned the way other people are positioned. I'm not, um, I don't know the things that other people know, and I've, I've missed out on things that I, I'm not even aware where, to, where they start because I don't know what they are. So um, I think it has, for me, I've used my experiences sort of as a sword. and. Um, the strength that my family has taught me, um, the the you know the same strength you see in the photographs, the uh, that is what I rely on to overcome, and it's that um, perseverance you know that um, that we all have in us, and I I think especially when you have that experience and you come from that background you you have it, and so 
just use it, you know, when it, just use it to overcome the things that you don't have. And so just keep going, keep persevering. And that's, that's how I've, I've overcome it. Can, can I, can I free, pair, uh, say that again? Uh, strength is my sword. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Oh, that, that is, that is, that's rich. That's yeah. so strong. Um, so to per per persevere, you know, and then that, that, that uh, generational trauma, you know, persevere from that and, and continue the storytelling without, well, one for me, um, I want to, I want to follow up with that, but like that it's, that it's, um, I myself have made it that point to break that, um, not wanting to talk about that. And, and, and what I mean by that is that, uh, like if, if we don't tell these stories, it's just, they're, it's just repression continuing on if we don't talk about them. And so, yeah, it is a painful topic to, to bring up and talk about. And for, Years and, and decades, I I would I would sit around um, and experience family members speak to stories that then it was just like they would stop, and so as I got older, I would I would retouch on those stories and 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 um, it is it, it is kind of a a like song and dance to like like I mean not you know not not to be so like you know, like to dance around a topic, but but it is like this like orchestrated way to how to get that information out of of my family members to to not repress that information and then, um, you, know, con you know, perpetuate and continue that, that um, trauma. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to think of also how I do that with my dad to, to open that back up again. It's, it's hard to like pinpoint how I f segue into that, but it, it, it presents itself. And when it does, I go until he says he does not, no longer want to talk about that anymore, um, which then, um, presents itself in a lot of my work. Um, so that's, that, that is a way of also then to um, flipping that, that narrative and, and telling, you know, telling that story in a different way. Yeah, I don't think um, like it ever ends, right? Like addressing these um, like generational traumas. I think what's worked, I think in my family at least is you know, or, or for me and my approach has been to keep having conversations about it, um, you know, because the first time I, there might be like a lot of resistance, right? And then maybe next time, you know, they're a little bit more perceptive to listening and, and just, you know, um, and then, you know, maybe you can reach some sort of, you know, understanding and maybe not, you know, because it's really hard to have conversations with parents, I think, you know, for example, like with mental health, like, um, you know, like at least in my family was not anything we ever talked about. And I, you know, just to be candid, like I had, you know, struggles, I think with that when I was like 10 or 11, um, to the point where like, they took me to therapy, um, which, you know, was like a big step for them because, um, you know, they were coming from a background where like, they were like, you just get over it. Um, you just don't think about that because, you know, I didn't know at the time, but now I understand, like, they've lived really hard lives. Um, and so they just had to do that for themselves because they, they just didn't have any other option, right? It's like you either pick yourself up or you, you know, it's over for you, you know? Um, so I think giving yourself grace, giving yourself time, um, you know, and, and making sure to not hold it in and, and you know, address it where you can, but also understand like, you know, sometimes the things you ha just have to let go for a bit and then revisit them when, when you can. Any other questions? No? Okay, so I want to thank all of our, Daisy, Juventino, and Laura for just such really good, um, wonderful talk and candid conversation. And I'm sure that they would be happy to have continue the conversation if you want to have a more personal dialogue. I also want to point out Michael and Lupe and Grace, and they would be happy to uh, talk about um, their story and the, the fight and how some of those pictures got captured with Erwin and um, probably a very iconic photograph of Lupe and Michael. Michael is such a great storyteller. Um, so, and so I think 
but we're going to end, and I want to, uh, so that you can actually see uh, Huentino's exhibit, the Nash exhibit, and for yourself instead of having us tell you what it's about. Um, again, I want to thank um, WSU Libraries. Of course, I'm going to say that I work for these guys. Um, <laughs> no, I, I love these guys um, for you know making this collection possible for um, preserving the collection. I want to thank Cleve and Judith. Uh, I want to thank Nancy. I want to thank Marilyn. Um, I want to thank Ryan for making and uh, Kristen for making this possible. Okay, so thank you so much, and go and see these this exhibit. <laughs>